Welcome to episode 53 of Anchored in Education. I'm E. Scott England, and Anchored in Education is the podcast dedicated to all things education. Educators across the world routinely engage in conversations surrounding fundamentals, concepts, and new ideas that improve this great profession. Sometimes we agree, other times we disagree. But at the end of the day, we are all anchored in education. Can you believe it? Every Monday for the past 52 weeks, a new episode of Anchored in Education has opened up with me saying, Welcome to episode 49, episode 1 of Anchored in Education. And what an amazing first year it has been. I'm going to spend a few minutes today recapping some of the highlights of the first 52 episodes. But before I do, I have to give one epic shout out. This podcast would not be possible without the encouragement and constant support of my wife, Jennifer. She was the one who said, why aren't you doing a podcast? You love to talk. Now, this is what I love about her. She was being completely serious and positively encouraging me to pursue this venture, but she is also sly and witty too, which is how it also ended up as a slight roast, as my kids would say, to my incessant talking. She has pushed and supported this adventure long before episode one ever aired. She's also one of the smartest people I know. I always tell people this, she is way smarter than I am. It's her you should be talking to. In fact, I would love for her to come on the podcast, but I don't foresee that happening in the near future. As she would say, she's introverted, but is willing to talk science. During the course of this first year of Anchored in Education, she has taken on a new position with Frontier Community College right here in Fairfield, Illinois. She has been tasked with building a medical laboratory technician program from the ground up. It's a daunting task for sure, but one in which she will undoubtedly excel. I have mentioned her several times throughout the first 52 episodes, usually talking about how she doesn't mince words or how she is a self-proclaimed science nerd. But she's my science nerd, and I love her. I also want to give a shout out to the fifth cohort of the Illinois School for Advanced Leadership, or ISAL for short. I began the 18-month ISAL journey with my cohort five friends a few months before episode one aired, but it was thanks to our first meeting that caused me to focus and set my priorities straight so I could organize thoughts and ideas and produce amazing episodes. I also have my listeners to thank. I know I have many regular listeners, but my pastor, Rob Morse, is a regular listener who reaches out via text about the latest episode or guest, and maybe I shouldn't admit this out loud, but I have actually built several podcasts out of ideas I have gathered from his preaching. He has also turned me on to some great books, including Turn the Ship Around by David Marquet, a two-time podcast guest. And of course, I have all of my guests to thank, but... I want to give a special shout out first to Dr. Zachary Stanifer for being the first guest on Anchored in Education. Zach is a friend of mine and incredibly in tuned with many areas, but I knew his expertise in retirement and savings would be the perfect fit for one of the early episodes of Anchored in Education. But imagine for just a second, even a good friend calling you up and saying, Hey, so I started a podcast a few weeks ago, and now I want you to be a guest. Oh, and I'm hoping it can be next week. Of course, Zach said yes and ended up first appearing as a guest on episode five and then rejoining two episodes later to talk more. Zach's episodes were some of the most downloaded for the longest time on Anchored in Education because of the relevance of teacher pensions and retirement security. But even as many states see their education budgets slashed, and even the federal government's recommendation of decreasing education by almost 8%, Zach still has this to say about becoming an educator. 
it is a rewarding career that has traditionally been seen as a very noble profession. Being informed about and trying to strengthen our teacher pension situation is a necessary component of keeping a career in education attractive enough to continue to draw the best and brightest from our pool of young people. In the first year, we also talked a lot about the teacher shortage. Dr. Kyle Thompson, another good friend of mine, was one of the first guests to give us his thoughts on the teacher shortage. We have far too many barriers or obstacles to college-aged students or individuals interested in teaching as a second career that we often see them leaving the profession before they get the chance to fully enter it as a result of those barriers. We also discovered that sometimes these barriers keep veteran teachers from staying too as was the case with Jonathan Carroll. You might remember Jonathan. Jonathan had a viral Facebook post last April on why he was leaving the profession. He joined us on Anchored in Education to talk about how education now is not the education he originally signed up for. When I did my evaluation, it's almost like I went in and defended my, my master's thesis again, uh, you know, or dissertation defense. It's like, well, why did you do X? Well, I did X because this is the support for it and this is the research I have for it. And I, I would actually go in sometimes with research I had gone out and found in graduate work and bring in articles that supported my pedagogy. Uh-huh. And and they, would, they wouldn't like that. They're like, but I want you to do this. I'm like, well, that isn't really something that is effective in my classroom. I'm a history classroom. I'm not a math teacher. You know, over the course of the year, I've often wondered how Jonathan has been doing since stepping away from the classroom, so I caught up with him to check in. He says that he has definitely been keeping busy, and an FYI, he says his life is amazing. He's had health improvements that have amazed his family, and his mental health has truly improved. It's interesting in that clip I played, though, that Jonathan used the word defend, because several weeks later, Joe Sanfilippo joined us and expounded on this. The, the thing that I think happened with us as educators, no matter what, what role we play, is we stopped being proud of the work and we started defending the work. Now, Joe was talking about educators as a whole defending all of education. He went on to talk about the hazards of using the word just when describing what it is we do. And that is, I think that there are a lot of educators in the world, and me included sometimes, where I'll say, if, when I used to say, like, I'm just to this or I'm just to that, we're hoping, we're hoping that the person that we're talking to kind of comes back at us and says, no, 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 you're fantastic, yeah. you're wonderful, you changed lives, you're the best thing that's ever happened to people, right? When they don't say that, then we start to believe that we're just because it wasn't refuted. Yeah. And that's the problem. Joe, of course, is absolutely right. We are more than just teachers, more than just administrators. We are leaders. We are support systems. We are tacklers of problems that the general public has no idea even exist inside our school walls. Guest Brandon Thornton highlighted some things teachers experience. To me, the hardest part is understanding that sometimes your job isn't to teach. And I know that sounds contrary, contradictory to like what we're supposed to be doing. Sure. But the reason it was so easy for me to switch from math to English was because I've always felt that I was bigger than just teaching the content. Um, like we said, advocate. Your job is to advocate for the kids with whatever they need in that moment. And oftentimes, it's just someone to talk to about a breakup or someone to give to bounce ideas back. Um, on substance abuse or someone to hook them up with the local food pantry. And so to me, that's the hardest part. Brandon, of course, is talking about the students. And students are exactly who we are here to serve. One of my favorite clips from the year, a clip that has been used in several other episodes, comes once again from our friend Joe Sanfilippo talking about how important students are. Like none of us have jobs if they're not there. And it also makes sense for a podcast on education that we talk about students a lot, which we did in the first year. But ultimately, like Joe said, isn't that who we are here for? Here's Mike Lubefeld talking about how he has included students in decision making in the past. But really, it's their classroom, it's their world. Yeah. Every subsequent classroom redesign and furniture effort, including phase two, involves students physically being involved and mentally being involved to help us make decisions. 
they became equal players and equal partners in the design process, the furniture process, the technology process, even in some pedagogy process. And it really opened my eyes to say, there's no limit to where students should be involved. Now our friend Trevor McKenzie, who is doing amazing things in Canada, also weighed in with incorporating student voice. Yeah, so, you know, first and foremost, I'm a big proponent of the more voice and choice our students have, the more structures and frameworks we should give them to be successful with that agency over learning. And, and you mentioned the inquiry process, those seven steps. That's definitely one of the frameworks that all of my students operate in to help them be successful with that agency over learning. But sometimes we put too much pressure on students, either us as educators or us as parents. This was highlighted when Charlie Cass joined us and talked about a blog post he read from a 16-year-old student. A few years ago, I read a really good blog post by a 16-year-old girl, and she wrote that she loved school in elementary school because learning was fun. They enjoyed the process of learning, and when she got older and it became about grades, she liked school a lot less uh, because it was less about learning and more about GPAs. And and we've talked about that with our teachers, you know, is this more about compliance or about learning? Now that came from one of the most controversial episodes of year one when Charlie and I talked about the unnecessary pressures on valedictorians and salutatorians. I actually received calls from some of my local friends thinking I was changing policy in my district. Definitely not, I reassured them, but it is worth the conversation so we can see things from all angles. And speaking of looking at things from all angles, we had an amazing look at poverty with Sherry Slinkard. She highlighted that poverty is much more than the lack of finances. It is also the lack of many other systems. It's just not about financial. Um, financial is important, but it's just one of many. Um, there's em emotional, so you, your self-esteem, your responses to things, um, your mental, you know, if you have some mental illness, or even just your ability to learn, you like to read and write things like that. Spiritual, if you believe in that, doesn't necessarily mean a religion. That's just having um, a belief and have a, having a purpose. Um, physical, being physically healthy. Um, and then support systems, just having people, having friends, family. Several months later, the conversation continued on meeting students' most basic needs when Julie Adams joined us for a two-part series. Julie summed it up nicely for everyone. Nobody wakes up to suck. During this first year, we talked a lot about change, which is often a dirty word in education. Okay, change is good, but, um, oh wait, you want me to do something? <laughs> That's our good friend Dr. Tony Frontier, author of The Five Levers to Improve Learning. He expounded on change a little more for us. Yeah, change, change is, is, is difficult, and, and what we know from the, the literature on, the chain, uh, on change and Shirley Hoard's work, for example, you know, out of the gate, all change is, is personal, right? So whatever system changes might be occurring, uh, we, we always kind of ask that question, well, hey, well, what do I have to do differently? Sometimes what we have to do differently is unlearn our past practices. Unlearning was my mantra of the 2016-2017 era, and this was thanks to two amazing friends, Dr. Mike Lubefeld and Dr. Nick Poliak, and their first book they co-authored, The Unlearning Leader. Here's Nick talking more about unlearning. And so, you know, we said, boy, if that's the case, if human beings are really good at learning, but we're really bad at unlearning, where does that cross over with the world of education? And so, you know, we asked ourselves questions like, why do we put desks in columns in rows in our classrooms? Because that's the classroom we're used to. That's not the classroom that's going to help kids collaborate with one another and be competitive in today's changing world. So we have to unlearn the constructs of what a classroom looks like. And so you can apply that to pedagogy. You can apply that to, you know, design of the school year. Why do we take summer vacation off? It's, you know, people say it's because of our agrarian society. I just saw a video today where they were interviewing farmers and said that doesn't help them at all. It actually goes back to German roots about energy consumption. And so, you know, we, we have a hard time unlearning these things that are no longer true. I stand by change being a good thing. Mike and Nick have helped me see that. Tony Frontier helped me see that. 
as have many others, including Amy Reed, a veteran teacher who in year 15 has put herself in a subject level she has never taught as well as teaching a grade level she has never taught in. Making a change in grade levels, subject levels, or even to a different school or position can be scary. But listen to what Amy had to say about her move. And I think had I not changed positions, I probably wouldn't have lasted. Now, if you listened to all of Amy's episode on changing, you would have learned how much time she put into making her change be successful. And time is something we at times struggle with. So, Dr. P.J. Capozzi joined us for an episode to talk about time management. P.J. wrote the book, Manage Your Time or Time Will Manage You, and it was an eye-opener for me. I had forever wondered why I had struggled with time management, but P.J. succinctly summarized why we say we're working on time management, but get nowhere with it. Obviously, we, we keep attacking the same problem the same way and not getting any different results. And so the way that I look at time management, I think, is the way that um, a lot of times we treat a diet. And so when you look at t- typical time management tips, techniques, hacks, whatever you want to call them, they're short-term solutions yeah. to a long-term problem. And so I think that if we keep looking at it that way, then what we're going to continue to have is you know, a million people writing about time management, a plethora of blogs, and all, all of the tips and techniques – are, are out there to be consumed. I just think it's time we take a little bit deeper look at why we actually are having the issues in the first place so that we can start addressing them in a meaningful way. Sometimes time management, though, is simply making sure we take time to manage ourselves. I'm talking educator self-care and my good friend, Dr. John Bartelt, an educator self-care extraordinaire. He joined us to talk about why this is so important. If we don't take care of ourselves, there's no way we're going to be able to take care of others around us. Just a few weeks before this episode with John aired, I presented at our teacher in service on taking care of ourselves. I made sure to only present in the morning and then put measures in place to make sure my staff took care of themselves that afternoon. Another reason I did this is because of the research on positive psychology. And just two weeks ago, I had author and Michigan teacher Chase Milkey on the podcast to talk about his book, The Burnout Cure. In this episode, we talked about how Chase almost walked away from teaching. A few years ago, I had very serious uh, considerations of leaving the classroom. I was applying and interviewing for jobs in the private sector. I was um, looking at other options, even in different schools. And I had reached that moment of, I don't know if I can do this. But using positive psychology practices, he stayed and has been on fire now more than ever. Here he is talking about that. It was a moment of irony because, you know, since I, like I said, since I was a junior in high school, I, I knew I wanted to teach. And most days with students, I had a lot of enjoyment. And the irony of it all was also that I was teaching a class on well-being. Uh, taking the science of positive psychology and helping students learn how to build more purpose and passion and perseverance. And so I had to look in the mirror and say, like, do I really believe in this stuff? Is it really worth it? its weight? So I decided to double down. I gave myself one more year. I said, if I could apply and put to practice all of this stuff that I've taught and learned about, and then I'll reevaluate. And I still stand by it. If I hadn't known the science of positive psychology and well-being, I probably would have left. I mentioned PD a minute ago. It's hard to mention PD and not think of the most amazing Allison Rodman, who has been a two-time Anchored in Education guest during this first year. You might remember her and her book, Personalized Professional Learning. Allison is a PD guru, but what she hits home the most is that we need to be offering relevant PD to our staff. To do this, we can't guess at what we think teachers need, and we can't assume we have all the PD answers. Instead, here is what Allison recommends. I would look to some type of needs assessment or survey that we could give teachers at least once a year to check in and say, what topics are of interest to you? To you? What, where are your passions? Where are your, your burning interests that, that we might be sure. able to leverage in, in order to make sure you get what you need to be successful in the classroom? So now would be a good time to give a huge shout out to Dr. Courtney Orzel. You might remember Courtney, 
She joined us to talk about women in leadership, but she had this to say about growing leaders, both men and women. It really comes down to seeing people in your own organizations and saying, have you ever thought about being a building principal? Or have you ever thought about the superintendency? Because I see you in that role. If you look at the research, Scott, it's very clear for men and for women, but particularly for women, that someone in their life, whether it be a spouse, someone um, in their family, it could be just a, a principal, another leader in the organization, said to them, have you ever thought about this? I think you can do it. And then they go out and do it. And we're giving her a PD shout out, though, because next year, Courtney will become an associate director with the Illinois Association for School Administrators in the area of professional development. Expect to be hearing from her again soon. Speaking of professional development, some of the best PD ideas out there have been centered around classroom management, so it only made sense to feature the book Classroom Management from the Ground Up. Joining me on this one was Madeline Good. Here is Madeline talking about why the book was structured like it was. And especially with new or beginning teachers or even teachers in the middle of their career that just need to kind of reassess what's going on in their classroom, we wanted to give them a structure that would make it easy to reflect back and think about what's going well and what could be adjusted. Speaking of new teachers, Madeline also co-authored another book called Your First Year. One of her co-authors was also her sister, Catherine Whitaker, and she joined me for that episode. Your First Year is one of my favorite books. In fact, when I was a principal, I used to buy the book and give it to new teachers. But my favorite part of the interview with Catherine was when she gave an important and very real disclaimer. So one of the things that I kind of want to put out there, because I think everybody who listens to podcasts or educational things thinks that everybody was an expert and like phenomenal from day one. I wrote this book because my first year was terrible. Okay. And I wrote this book because I didn't know what to do. Like, I I didn't know what to do before the school year started. And then I didn't know what to do during the school year when things were hitting the fan, you know? Yeah. And so I wrote this uh, after my third year of teaching because I finally had started to figure things out. Um, And so literally, I love this book because I wish I had had it. I know how hard being a new teacher can be. This is why I featured two guests during episode 16. Aaron DeLay and Andrea Samayoa had just wrapped up their first year, so naturally, I had them on to see how it went. So needless to say, it was very overwhelming. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was just, you know, I was there five minutes and it just kind of like hit me. Oh my God, like this is it. This is my class and there's 15 of them and one of me and... I have to figure out how to make this work. I think every teacher remembers that first day. Um, and if there's a teacher out there who doesn't, I need you to like reevaluate your life choices <laughs> because you, there is a visceral feeling of being in that classroom. Um, and you're no, you're no longer supervised. There's no longer someone there to help you out. There's no longer a, a, like a person down the hall that you can be like, Oh, Hey, could you step in and help me? You are it. You are the authority. You're that person. You're, the, you're, you're that person. You're the one in charge. And I got to tell you, it would probably be an uncomfortable family gathering if I failed to mention that my sister has been a two-time Anchored in Education guest. But let me just say, I didn't have her on because she was my sister. I had her on because she is an amazing veteran art teacher. Here she is talking about where we can find art in the schoolhouse. Well, art's everywhere. It's all around us and can be connected to broader concepts really easily. So anytime teachers can do this, it's really great. Um, Although the act of just creating is beneficial for children in so many ways. So art for art's sake is definitely enough. Any art making is really fantastic. I also featured two educators who were extremely excited to offer their view on education. Dr. Bhavna Sharma Lewis is a superintendent in Northern Illinois whose excitement and passion for education is infectious. And I think the excitement and the positive momentum of a new beginning, you get to start all over, a new chance to energize and inspire people. The other is Dr. Jennifer McCormick. She is the Indiana Superintendent for Public Instruction and was also the first elected official to come on the podcast. 
Here she is giving us her thoughts on legislative overreach. I do. I think that local control is huge. I also think making sure that we have the fiscal backing for that local control has to be aligned with it. Of course, I often voice my opinion on politics, and I know that I often let my implicit bias become explicit, especially when discussing politics, which is why I invited Megan Fucciarelli onto Anchored in Education to talk about implicit bias. Implicit bias are our first thought, and core beliefs is how we live our life. And it's really important to separate the two because oftentimes when people get um, or are told that they have bias, they get very defensive. So as you can see, we had many educators stop by in the first year of Anchored in Education, but we also tapped into the knowledge of many people who are outside of the profession, but they are still connected and making an impact on those of us still here. Two guys I loved hearing from were Kyle Green and Jonathan Edison. Both had amazing stories on their childhood growing up and how they persevered. Kyle wrote The Mentality Changer and spoke to us about changing our mindset to achieve our goals. Like once you kind of get out that mindset and say, you know what, maybe I can be the first. Maybe I'll be the first person in my family to, to graduate from high school and go off to college. Maybe I'll be the first person in my family to graduate from college. Maybe I'll be the first person in my family to start a business. Jonathan penned survival mode, and in our conversation, he spoke about how important it was to share motivation and inspiration in our schools. There, there are kids, there are young people, there are teachers, there are educators, there are people that need to hear your voice. If you haven't already, you should definitely go back and give their episodes a listen. I also had another amazing guest on to talk about food. Actually, Tracy Brown talked about how we talk about food around students. This was one of my favorites because it caused us to stop and think. When you have lunches with them, talk, you know, here's your food and, and enjoy it and eat a variety of food with them. And modeling is the most important thing. It's always going to boil down to that, right? Modeling, sure. enjoy, enjoying movement, enjoying food, eating a variety of food, talking positively about bodies and what they can do. Speaking of knowing what to say in a given situation, Dr. David Schoenfeld, director of the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, joined Anchored in Education for back-to-back episodes to talk about what to do in the event of a school crisis as well as how to handle student bereavement. And I had him on for a couple of reasons. First, I was a student who lost a parent in school, and I have always thought my teachers could have done better in supporting me. Second, as a teacher, I in turn had students lose family members, and then I realized how difficult it was as a teacher. Here is Dr. Schoenfeld talking about grief and trauma triggers. So with grief triggers, they kind of become bittersweet over time. With trauma triggers, you want to avoid them. Sure. Um, With grief triggers, it's like going to the cemetery is going to remind you of the person that died, but it helps you then cope with it. So I I think we just need to recognize grief triggers occur, go over with teachers how to handle that. I also mentioned my dad passing it in another episode, too. It was when our guest was Jennifer Cheney, the region director for Kids Heart Challenge. Since my dad's passing, I am a big supporter of the American Heart Association. I know working with schools is so important is 80% of this disease can be prevented, meaning it doesn't have to happen. And so sitting down with kindergartners and first graders and second graders and, and being able to work with a school year after year. My dad was also a musician, so I know he would have loved Dr. Lee Whitmore, the executive director for the Grammy Music Education Coalition. We took time to talk about how important music education is in our public schools. If you're listening today, whether you're a music educator or an administrator, you work in another subject matter area or discipline, um, Please be sure to talk about music programs, to encourage young people to be a part of music, and remember that brain research that we talked about, which is just one anecdotal point of many. You know who else is passionate about education, improving, and inspiring? Coach Jim Johnson. 
You might remember Coach Jim Johnson as the coach who put Jason McElwain, better known as J-Mac, in the game on senior night who ended up lighting up the last four minutes of the game to put down 20 points. It became a national story of inspiration because J-Mac is also autistic. The story and the book can bring a tear to your eye. Coach Jim Johnson has been a two-time guest on Anchored in Education. I think the, the great uh, lesson from the story is that you know they're giving people an opportunity, and, and you know the famous "Don't judge a book by its cover." Another two-time guest, retired submarine captain L. David Marquet. He authored the best-selling book, Turn the Ship Around, which focused on how implementing intent-based leadership empowered those around him. He then released another book, just a month ago, called Leadership is Language. Here, David is talking about shifting our thinking as an organization. And we love being a can-do organization. And we're so good at getting stuff done. But... But what I think we need more now is a can-think organization. And I think this has ramifications for business and education. What I loved about David, though, is that he doesn't blow smoke. There was no hesitation when I said I wanted to interview someone who served on his submarine to testify about intent-based leadership. I didn't just get one, I got two. Chuck Dumphy and Andy Warshek stopped by Anchored in Education to talk about how intent-based leadership truly is empowering. Even though I wasn't a submarine officer and, you know, a driver of submarines, you know, I was still asked a lot about, you know, how would you, what do you think about this and how would you drive the submarine on this? And it, it was because I had a lot of experience driving a surface ship. And so now I was driving a submarine. So David had value you know, we put value on my experience on a surface ship uh, to bring that to the submarine, which was, I was surprised. It was liberating to have the captain say to us that, and I was his sonar chief, so I owned, I owned that system for him, but to have him ask me what I thought we should do with the system or how it should be utilized or how we should utilize our people rather than being told what, what was going to be done was incredibly liberating. You know, I've just about wrapped up the review of year one, but there are a couple of other guests I have to thank. The first one is my neighbor, Wheeze. Okay, his name is Brian, but I'm pretty sure all of Southern Illinois knows him as Wheeze. You can check out the beginning of that episode to find the origin story on his nickname. While you are there, you can check out our conversation on athletics, Another borderline controversial episode in which we explore the uptick in athletic pressures in our young students. Well, it's something that, I mean, you see a lot more of the organized, the year-round club ball. Um, You see a lot more pressure from the parents where it used to be more play. There's a lot more pressure from the parents now, at least in this area. Um, Kids seem to play less unorganized sports. I also had a conversation with Ron Nazoy formerly the interim CEO for ASCD last year and now the associate executive director. Ron, as well as ASCD as an organization, recognized the efforts and hard work of educators. Yeah, you know, it's like anything else, right? The greater the risk, the greater reward. Yeah. You know, the educators today who are doing these amazing things with kids, um, to, to your point, not only do I hope that they feel that satisfaction, but also, you know, they really deserve the kind of credit and recognition for that because, as you know, it, this is, you know, it's never easy. But right, this this stuff is this stuff is really challenging. And I didn't mean to save him for last, but Dr. Josh Martin was my guest for episode number fifty-two. It was hard picking a highlight from that episode, though, because Josh gave such great insights into so many things. But in the end, I went with his reflection on how we approach grades. Well, see, and I think the first the first thing is, you know, getting away from looking at who passed and who failed, uh-huh. you know, and looking at that percentage. That's the I mean, it's the first thing we want to look at because, you know, that's how we're judged and, and all that stuff. But that at the end of the day, that really doesn't tell us anything. Well, that was the first year of Anchored in Education in a nutshell. It has been a lot of fun bringing a fresh new episode to you each week. It is exciting talking to guests and learning from them. 
I'm excited for the guests coming up this year. So far, we have slated educators, more elected officials, people from outside educations, new guests, and returning guests. Plus, I have a couple solo episodes coming up in which I'll just share some thoughts with you. I want to thank you for listening to Anchored in Education. If you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. Tweet about it using hashtag Anchored in Education or tagging me using my Twitter handle at EscottEngland. Tell your friends and family, and most important, hit me up with ideas or suggested guests. And don't be too humble. If you've got something to talk about or share, suggest yourself. You can reach me via email at podcast at eScottEngland.com. I'd love to have a conversation with you, because at the end of the day, we are all anchored in education.